I count it a joy and a blessing to be at Nairobi Central this morning. And I would like to greet you and say good morning, blessed of my father. I trust you are equally blessed and highly favored. And I think you may probably be aware that I actually have only one sermon title in my life, too blessed to be stressed. The rest are just colorants, but otherwise there's only one sermon title. And I think I'll tell you a story related to that at the end. Uh, allow me first to take the first few minutes and talk to the children. It's their day today, isn't it? Just a few minutes to, to talk to them, because we are talking about children and praying for children who are at risk. Are there children in the house? Where are you? All right, you are here. I want to say to you this morning, you are too complete to be compared to anyone. You know, this life has a way of forming us according to the standards of this world. They will tell you your nose is broad, your mouth is too big, you are too dark. That's how the world will tell you. But I, 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 that's what the world will say to you. But I want to say to you, children, you are special as you are in the eyes of Jesus. Allow me to go further and say, you can never lift others unless you are lifted by Jesus Christ. And let me say this to you one more time. Jesus loves you and made you the way you are. Don't compare yourself with another person. This world can come up with yellow bone, black is beautiful, and all that. To Jesus, we are all beautiful the way we are. So be proud and love yourself. Accept yourself the way you are. Never ever think you were another person. Look at your finger. Your fingerprint is different from any other person here. And your brain is different from any other person here. What does that mean and what does that say to you and me? It says to you, little child of God, you are very special and there is something that Jesus has put in you that he has not put in any other person. So when you compare yourself with another person, you deprive us as the world, the great treasure that God has put in you. And you are going to die with that. So turn over to somebody who is next to you and tell them, I'm special in the eyes of Jesus. And tell them, I love myself the way I am. I will allow Jesus to improve and develop me to be a better person. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right. Our sermon title today, Two favored to be frivolous. Too favored to be frivolous. What, what does this mean? Let me, because I've spent a lot of time on favor, let me now explain what frivolicity means. Frivolous simply means this, that it's a person who is just floating in life without a purpose or a purpose, depending on where you went to school. Or it means a person who has no aim whatsoever. They just find themselves, wherever they get, they have arrived. They have no direct aim as to what they want to achieve in their lives. And therefore, allow me to talk to us as parents today and say to us, we are praying for children at risk, but we can be the risk to these children. Uh, are you there with me? Some children are at risk of failing to go through school and there are people who have money in this church and they are not sponsoring them. There are children today who are growing up in homes of Christians, professed leaders of the church, but the risk is that they are at the risk of misinterpreting the character of God because of the way those who profess to be Christians live their lives before them. Are you there with me? And that will show that you are just living a life of frivolicity. You are not living a life where you are favored by God. 
And allow me to say this. None of us here can cheat our children or our spouses. They know whether we are Christians or we are not. Those are the people that you need to ask. You need to ask my wife and ask my children, is this man a Christian? Does he portray the character of Jesus Christ? Some of us, we can sit here, we can lead the church of God, but if our children do not see the Jesus who lifts us in our characters, then we are living a Christianity of frivolicity. Does that make sense to us? So the risk, and this is the greatest risk, not going to school is nothing. Anyone can sponsor you. Even non-Christians can do that. But if your own children in your home do not see Christ in your life, that is the greatest risk because they will leave church and they will miss heaven. So what kind of a Christian am I? What kind of a Christian are you? But thank God I have good news for you today. We are favored by God. We are favored by God. I think this one has to be clear to us. There are four ways, actually two set of four ways that I would like us to, to contemplate on as we look at this uh, sermon for today. When you read the text that my sister read wonderfully, Psalms 30 verse 5, the Bible says, For his anger is but for a moment. His favor is for what? You know, all my life I've been looking at this text and all I focused on was joy, I mean, was, was weeping in joy for a what? For a night, but joy comes in the morning. But most of the time we miss the second line. His favor is for life. And his anger is for what? For just a moment. And then it goes on to say, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. This is beautiful. I love this Bible. I love this book. This book can change your life, can change your, your character, can change everything about your life. Four words here. The first word, anger. The second word, favor. The third word, weeping. And the fourth word, joy. Are we there together? What are the words? Anger, favor, weeping, and joy. These are the words. And then the other set of words are connected, collected, conveying, and current. They all start with C. What's the first word? Connected, conveying, I mean collected, conveying, and current. We will go into that. The Bible says in verse 5, in, in verse 5, or the first line of verse 5, for his anger is but for a moment. Whose anger? The Bible tells us about the anger of God, that God's anger is for a moment. But allow me to say to you, there are some of us who allow anger to be there for the rest of our lives. Thank God that we worship a God who can be angry, an emotional God. When I cry, he understands my tears. When I am angry, he understands my anger. Thank God that his anger is for a moment. In other words, when you are a Christian, your anger should follow the anger of your God and be a momentary anger, and then you enjoy in the presence of God. I don't know if this makes sense. But this is what the Bible says. When we go to the book of uh, Ephesians, I think it's Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 26. Is Ephesians in the New or in the Old Testament? Oh, okay. Even mine is in the New Testament. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse, what did I say? Verse 26. Now, now th this tells me that God is able to control his anger. But you and me are struggling to control our anger. And now God says to us, uh, 4 verse 20, where am I? I'm seeing Colossians here. Where is Ephesians? All right. The Bible here says in verse 26, be angry and do not what? In other words, anger can lead to what? To sin. And then it goes on to say, do not let the sun go down on your wrath. 
or on your anger. In other words, when you keep anger for some time, then you begin to be wrathful. You begin to tell others and put them down and try to put them in their place. Who are you to put them in their place when you have not created them? Uh, are you there with me? That, that's what we normally say. And then verse 26 says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun... Oh, sorry, 27. Nor give place to the what? Are you aware that when you are angry, you lose your mind and the devil takes control of it? I've been to prison to pray for people and a person will say to me, Pastor, I didn't intend to kill my wife. It was just the fits of anger. That's how demons work. When you nurse anger for a long time, you become an, a, a, an instrument of the devil and you represent the devil. Even in your home, to your wife or to your children, you become a devil when you are angry over something. Are you there with me? That's why as God's children, we are too blessed to be stressed even by anger. Uh, are you following me? I don't know if you are with me, church. Why am I saying this? Somebody said to me, a friend of mine in Egypt said to me, Pastor, I always hear you saying you are too blessed to be, pressed, to be stressed, but I have my stresses. I said, okay, you can keep them. But for me, the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, cast all your cares upon me. So Christ is literally saying, Paul is saying to you, when you have an issue with your wife, when you have beef with your child, take it to the Lord in prayer. Unburden yourself so that the Holy Spirit can flow through you. Some of us are angry and we are blind and we can't even see the future because anger is inhibiting the power of God working in our lives. Therefore, do not be angry and less anger until the sun sets on it. That's what God is saying, take it to me in prayer. Why does it say God's anger is for a moment? Let's look at God. God, my brothers and sisters, praise God. I like this text. It says this anger is for a moment. What it means is that God's anger is for a moment to his children when they do wrong. But his anger against sin is permanent. Uh, are we there together? Can we get the difference? God's anger is for a moment. And let me try and illustrate this. When you look at the book of Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve were told they saw God in the first time. The first television they ever saw was the face of God. They walked with God, they ate with God, they sang with God, they spent the Sabbath with God, and they decide to listen to the devil than listening to God. As a parent, don't you be angry? God was so angry at Adam and Eve, but it was for a what? For a moment. For the Bible tells me in chapter 3 of Genesis verse, verse 8 that then they heard God walking in the garden. And he was calling and asking, Adam, where are you? He's still the same God. He's not saying, why did you do this? Oh, I told you not to do this. I mean, you know how the way we speak when we are angry. You even get words and the devil will fill you with so much vocabulary that you have never had in your life when you are angry because the demons are at work. So when his anger is for a moment and he says, let not the sun go on your anger, you are actually adding east to your anger. And God, when he is angry, he comes walking into the garden and he says, my son, Adam, you don't know what you are missing. Where are you? I am God who created you. Please come back to me so that you may enjoy life. He was angry at the devil. He was angry at Adam. With Adam, it was for a moment. And then he calls him, come back to me, my son. When God was angry with Nebuchadnezzar, he took him off the throne, of course. Okay, let me go back to Adam and Eve. Some people will say, no, but God was so angry with Adam, he took them out of the garden and he threw them out. Allow me to say to you, when the Bible says God's favor is for life, when he threw them out, it was for their favor. You know why? Because there was the tree of life in the garden. If they ate that tree, they will remain sinners alive forevermore. 
So when he closed them out, he's giving them what? A favor. He's doing them a favor to say, stay out so that I can deal with sin in you. And then when the time comes, when Jesus comes, you'll resurrect with all your children and you'll be presented before me. God's favor is for life, my brothers and sisters. And the Bible says, reminds us also that in chapter 4 of the book of Daniel, you remember Nebuchadnezzar. He stood up and said, isn't this Babylon that I have built? Glory is only, a, is, it's only God's prerogative. None of us has a right to take any glory. Whenever you have done something good, give glory to him for he's the one who gives you strength. He was warned. Daniel told him. He explained the dream to him, but he would not listen. And one day he was standing and he was walking. And he was saying, isn't this my power that did all this? And immediately, that which he was told and warned about happened to him. You remember? And what happened? He was taken out. How many years? That was not only punishment. In the devil's view, it was punishment. For God was angry for that moment. And then he took him out. As the devil thought this is only punishment, God was saying, I'm polishing you to know who I am. Are you there with me? Because when he comes back, he acknowledges God. And you know, if God was, if God was like some of us, he would leave the throne and he would never come back to it. But with God, when he has worked in your heart, maybe some of us, we need to eat grass in order to understand the spirit of God. Maybe some of us, we eat too much flesh and we need to be vegetarians in order to hear what God is saying to us. Because at times we walk into the church, we are so proud. I'm the only pastor here. I'm the only preacher here. I'm the only elder here. If I'm not there in the choir, they will not sing. My brother, my sister, that is a clear indication that your cup is still empty. Let Jesus fill it. It's not about me in the church. It's not about you, but it's about God. His favor is for life. The anger of God, when he was angry, Nebuchadnezzar was eating grass. When he was angry with sin, Nebuchadnezzar sat back on his throne. When he was angry with sin, Jesus was on the cross. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, while we were yet sinners, what did God do? Christ died for us. He demonstrated his love in this, that while we were sinners, Christ did what? Died for us. You know, this favor is amazing. Some of us here were thieves, and he protected you, your life. You were never run over by a car. You were never shot. Some of us, our friends, were shot right here. But his favor said, no, until you come to me and know who I am. Are, are, are you there with me? That is God's favor, my brothers and sisters. And then the Bible goes on to say, weeping may endure for a night. You know, even when we are weeping, God understands our tears. In case you don't believe, Psalm 58, I mean 56, verse 8. Listen to what it says. This one I must read. Psalm 56, verse 8. The Bible says, You number my wanderings. Sometimes we wonder, we think we are by ourselves. But my tear, you, you, you wonder, you number my what? My wanderings. Whatever trouble you have gone through, Jesus has numbered all the troubles. They are written. He knows what you go through. Sometimes we sing songs like, nobody knows the troubles that I see. My brother, my sister, that's not true. God says, I don't only see them, I even number them. I know their number. You are not alone. I am with you. Verse 2, I mean, the next one says, but my tears into your bottle. Are they not in your book? He writes the amount of tears you have cried. No matter the letters, God has listed them because he loves you and his favor for you is for life. You know, this, I don't have time to expand on this, but this, this means, you know, when they wrote this, when you were mourning in the Jewish culture there, 
they will bring bottles. And as they are crying, they will put the bottle here and the tears will drop in there. And as you are mourning your loved one, they will put these bottles here and you remember that somebody cried with me or cried for me, sympathized with me. But my God goes beyond just crying. He solves your problems. Praise God. That's what my God can do. And then it goes on to say, but joy comes when? Comes in the morning. When you understand that God loves you, he favors you, you'll favor other people. You know why people hate each other? You know why we have tribalism? You know why we have capitalism and all these things? It's because we are still full of ourselves. We have not sacrificed ourselves on the altar of sacrifice. Such that even in the church at times, we can be tribalistic. Why? Because our minds are not changed. Romans chapter 12 verse 2, what does it say? Be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the what? By the renewal of your mind. So I want to say to us this morning, when we understand the favor of God, we will know that we are God's favorite and we will favor others, including the children who are at risk. Are, are, are you with me? Then it goes on to say, but joy comes when? Joy comes in the morning. This, this is a beautiful one. You know, the Apostle Paul says in, Roman, in uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, Rejoice in who? In the Lord. And always again I say what? You don't rejoice in the answer to the prayer. You rejoice in the Lord because there are greater what answers that are coming to your prayer even in the future. If you rejoice in the gift and forget the giver, later when you have a problem, the gift will not be able to give you what you want. And allow me also to read, uh, to read here Isaiah chapter 50, 51, I think it's verse 11. Isaiah 51 verse 11, talking about joy. Isaiah 51 verse 11. Where is Isaiah? In the new or in the old? I am struggling here. Whatever has happened to me. Isaiah 51 and verse what? Verse 11. Talking about joy. And, and let me say this. You know, there's a difference between joy and happiness. Happiness depends on happenings. But joy comes from within. It happens I have a new car, I am happy. And what happens if the car is gone? The happiness disappears. But when I have joy in the Lord... Joy can change circumstances, but happiness is dependent on circumstances. So when you are favored by God, things may change, but you remain resolute that the joy of the Lord is with you. Okay, Psalm 51 and verse 11. The Bible here says, For the redeemed of the ransomed, so the ransomed of the Lord shall return, and come to Zion with singing and with everlasting joy on their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness. Sorrow and sighing shall flee. How far? Away forevermore. The favor of the Lord is for life. It doesn't matter what you go through. You may weep. Some children are weeping right now. They are struggling. Where am I going to find someone to take me to school? Where am I going to find someone to love me? Just to show me the love of God. But I want to say to you today, we are here and God can do it through us. And I give you an example as I finish in the Old Testament. I like stories. My Lord used to tell stories. In 1 Kings chapter 17, we see a clear story of the favor of God even in trouble. 17 chapter, chapter 17 and verse 8 in the book of 1 uh, Kings. Verse 8, from verse 8, I will read this story and then I will explain it a bit. The Bible says, Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, Dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, indeed a widow was there gathering what? Gathering sticks. 
And he called to her and said, Please bring me the, the little, a little water in a cup that I may drink. Verse 11. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. So she said, As the Lord God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bean and a little oil in a jar. And see, I am gathering what? A couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may what? Eat and what? But what did God start by saying here? I have already commanded. The lady, God is thinking life. The lady is thinking what? Death. Our minds need to be renewed when we come before God. Go, it goes on to say, Then Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but make the small cake from it first and bring it to me. And afterward, make some for yourself and your son. For thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, the bean of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the, be the jar of oil run dry until the day the Lord sends what? Rain on the earth. So she went away and did according to the word of Elijah. Elijah rather. And she and her, and she and he and her household ate for many days. The bean of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Elijah. Praise the Lord. I don't know if you see something here in this story. Number one, we don't have time to go above. The God who favors us can even use devils to feed us. Unclean animals. When the brook dried up, what happened? Before it dried up, who was feeding Elijah? The ravens were coming, and clean animals were bringing clean food. So God does not need us to feed the children. He can do it through children. The children who are, I mean, he can do it through, through animals or even through birds. But he wants us that as we feed others, as we take care of the risks that they have in their lives, what happens to us? We are transformed to have the character of Jesus Christ. And then he says to the lady, I have, he says to Elijah, I have already been to Zarephath. <laughs> this is amazing. Before we get into a situation, Christ has walked that road. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 we have a high priest. What kind of a high priest? Who knows? Not by information, but by experience what we go through. Praise the Lord. His favor is for life. And he's in the sanctuary there for us, for you and me. So he goes and he says, I've already commanded the lady. Unfortunately, somehow the lady forgot. And she says, I have nothing. Now, I want you to note something here. God sends Elijah, not to a rich person, but to a poor lady who can hear the voice of God. And I like what the, it happens here as we, we end. Children at risk. What was the risk here? The boy would die, right? And the mother would die. But God says, don't worry, I've already taken care of what? Of that situation. Now, can you imagine with me? The lady agreed according to the word of the man of God, to do what? To go and bake the first cake for who? For the man of God. Do you agree with God that you will pray and serve the children at risk? Will you be a true Christian in your house, in your workplace, wherever you are? The lady agreed, and what happens? The Bible says the oil never ever what? Dried up. The flour never ever disappeared. It remained there until the drought was over. Now, can you imagine the joy, joy that comes to the boy? Remember we said the lady now is connected to who? To God, right? Connection. Connected to who? To God. And she collects the words of God and she makes them hers. And as she takes these words, these words perform a miracle in her life. And she conveys what? 
the cake to the man of God, and there's joy in the family. I don't know if you see what I see. She becomes current now. She's not even worried about the future. Now imagine the boy, the joy in the boy's face. He sat down with the mother. They prayed that morning. This is the last flower. This is the last oil, my son. I'm going to collect firewood. We are going to cook. And when we cook, that's it. We are gone. There is no food anywhere. Are you there with me? There is no food. But God comes into the situation. I want to say to us, church, there is a man called Emmanuel. It doesn't matter what situation you may be in, you are not alone. He walks into the situation and he turns it around. You go and walk with that man. You can then see what others are going through, what others are struggling with, and then you'll be able to, be, to see the joy of being in the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now imagine this boy. After the prophet is gone, he goes to check. When the mother, the mother says, can you go and bring the oil? And the boy runs. And what does he find? The oil is the same level where it has been. It's enough for them to cook and eat. He takes it back. It's empty. When he comes back tomorrow, there is oil again. What is this saying to this boy? There is God in heaven who can take care of you even when your parents are not here. The children who are at risk, they need to know and see from us that Jesus can take care of them. Are you there with me, church? This word, Deuteronomy 8 verse 4, what does it say? Men shall not live by bread alone, but by what? By every word that comes from the mouth of God. So when you and me follow the instructions of God, as he tells us in this word, to take care of the needy and pray for the children at risk. We don't only see miracles in their lives, but we see miracles in our own lives. God is favoring us by involving us in the ministry to the kingdom of heaven. That's a favor to us. So we are too favored to be frivolous. We need to learn, brothers and sisters, that when I go to work, I can be kind to them, showing them who Jesus is in their lives. Allow me to say this morning as I end, I was here June 3 last year. Little did I know, just by standing here and saying, our sermon title is too blessed to be stressed, somebody, somewhere would be touched. And I want to thank you, KBC, for what you are doing around this country. On the 26th of April last month, I was at a Bible conference at Jamhuru Park. And as I was there, I finished presenting, and then I left and I went to, to the car. And as I was on my way to the car, a young girl came running as fast as she could with a very broad smile on her face. And as she came, she stopped me and said, Sir, please stop. And I stopped and she said, I just came here to say to you, thank you very much for saving my life. I said, what do you mean? I don't know you. I have no idea. He says, I see you are in a rush, but let me just give you a bit of it. He said, last year, on the 3rd of June, I was at home, and I had made up my mind that night that I'm taking my life. I've had enough of life. I was 16 years of age then. And then television was on, and I heard a voice saying, you are too blessed to be stressed. And then she says, I know you don't have much time. I sat down to listen. The rest is history. I rejoice in the Lord today. Brothers and sisters, you don't have to be an expert. I'm not an expert in anything here. I just decided I will follow, trust, and obey what the Lord wants me to do. And somebody saved somewhere. You may not have much. God is not asking for much. God is just asking for your heart. Once you take God in your heart, he will do things with nothing that you have. Little in God's hands is great. Let's go and attend to the children at risk. Let's not only pray for them, but let's praise God in their presence by helping them to see there's a God who cares in heaven. The song we are going to sing now, 
it says, trust and obey. For there is no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. Is there someone this morning who says, I want to trust and obey? There's a, in this song, <clears throat> history. It was a Christian meeting like this. And Pastor Simmons was preaching. And a young man said, I want to trust and obey. I don't know, I don't understand, but I just want to trust and obey. Do what God wants me to do. And then the, the pastor took the song and wrote the song that we are going to sing. And I want to say to us, if you are here and you just want to trust and obey, why don't you stand with me as we are going to pray together? And there may be a young person here, an elderly person here, a visitor in this place who says, I just want to give my life to Jesus. I want to experience his favor in my life. And I want him to be the Lord of my life. And if you are such this morning, give that heart to Jesus this morning. Let's sing the song. 590 in ISD Hymns, Trust and Obey. and the chorus. I pray this morning, I don't have time to call you forward, but wherever you are, you hear the voice of God speaking to you, and you want to trust and obey, and follow Jesus, and be baptized to walk with Jesus, to experience his favor in your life. Wherever you are, just put up your hand as I pray. Our gracious, loving, heavenly Father, I want to pray this morning for the children who are at risk. May you touch them and open their eyes that they may see you and accept you as the Lord of their lives. I pray this morning, Father, for us who are here as parents, who at times allow our anger to fester and turn into wrath that we become roaring lions in our homes. Our children sometimes can't even talk to us because they are afraid of us. Break us down through the power of the Holy Spirit. That our children, our wives, our husbands may have a clear picture of who Jesus is in their lives. Thank you, dear Jesus. As we all stand here and say we will trust and obey, may the power of the Holy Spirit sweep sin and all that comes with it out of our hearts and our lives as we surrender all to Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.